Hello, everybody. I have the pleasure of introducing Tianan Wong. Uh, Tianan earned his bachelor's in mathematics at Vassar College, and then he obtained his PhD from City University of New York. After that, he held postdoctoral positions at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, at the Indian Institute of Science and Education and Research at Prune in India, and also in Smith College. Uh, since uh, the beginning of this fall, he has been an assistant professor at our Department of Mathematics and Statistics. His research area is in number theory, but he also has a special interest in social justice. Today, he'll talk about can mathematics be anti-racist? Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess I should qualify this by saying that I'm not a, you know, I guess I'm not a specialist and I, I, I guess I, mean, I would say that nobody's a specialist in this, so I feel a bit better about that. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks for the you know in invitation and it's nice to see a lot of uh, mostly familiar faces um, or names. Uh, so I feel a bit less intimidated because this is also my first time giving like a, <laughs> like a Zoom talk. Uh, that's not, you know, uh, and it's also like with a larger audience, uh, that's not just, you know, mathematicians. Uh, so yeah, so please bear with me and like, please just ask any clarifying questions. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about was um, just to clarify what this talk is and isn't about. Um, if I know how to do this. Um, so yeah, so this is not about how, how mathematics is taught uh, specifically because um, that's, you know, it's a whole field uh, that's called of uh, mathematics education research. They think about things like critical pedagogy, ethnomathematics, you know, academic realism, rehumanizing mathematics, and those these are like very uh, maybe some 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 more fancy words than others that mean a lot of things. Um, so I don't. Uh, so uh, this talk is not about these things. I, I should first of all say, um, you know, so there's so for maybe for people who aren't so familiar, there's kind of a. Uh, like a major division within like, I guess what we call mathematics, that's like mathematics uh, where people, you know, uh, and like think about, you know, numbers and uh, the things that are related to numbers and, uh, and the people who think about mathematics education and how mathematics is taught, right? And I'll say for off the bat that, you know, those people, they've been thinking about these sort of, these kinds of things uh, for a long time, right? Because uh, they think about how math works in the classroom and, uh, you know, how it fits in, you know, the larger education system. And we think about, you know, sort of issues as they intersect with, you know, gender and, and race and class and all these kinds of things. Um, so, uh, and I actually also in like 2017, there was like a, you know, kind of like a little, uh, uh, I don't want to say controversy because it wasn't really a controversy. It was just more of like a, uh, I guess an event that happened. That was like kind of a, someone like said something about privilege in mathematics, and then there was like a big backlash, and then they got doxxed, and then there was it was a, it was a big issue, um, and uh, they wrote a paper about it, <laughs> um, and so they yeah so this is this is like a, a an ongoing conversation within the math mathematics education uh, field, and so that's. Um, and this talk is going to be more about like how mathematics is used, right? How um, how we think about those numbers and what we do with those numbers. Yeah. So just to set the stage for that. Uh, so the question is not so much how can math mathematics be taught in an anti-racist way, because again, like this, lots of people have thought a lot about these things. Um, and it, this is more about how can mathematics be used in an anti-racist way. Uh, and I think uh, we haven't, as a mathematics research community, haven't thought about this as much, and uh, it seems at least to be a question that's worth asking. You know whether or not the answers are <laughs> valuable or not. I think it's a question that you know seems to be something that we might want to think about. Uh, so, uh, so I'll start by you know uh, asking you know can math math be racist, right? Is, which is the you know before we talk about anti-racism and to maybe to backtrack a little bit, we we'll just talk about scientific racism more generally. Um, and that's, this is also, again, something that's pretty, you know, it's pretty broad and I'll just pick out a few uh, examples. So the first example I'll go, I'll, I'll point to is uh, Carl Linnaeus, uh, who, uh, you know, he was a Swedish, I guess he was a biologist uh, in, in the 1700s. And, um, you know, all these uh, taxonomies, you know, with like biological names, you know, or, you know, go back to this person, right? And he wrote a thing, uh, I guess, a book uh, in Latin, because, you know, I guess that's, the, you know, that's, the, that's, the, that's how, how they did, did the things in those days, uh, this thing called Sistema Nature, and, and where he talked about the class, classification of different species, and, you know, I guess, classes and or, 
um, genera, genus, or, uh, species, and stuff like this in nature. And among the things that he was trying to classify was humans, right? Um, so he uh, classified uh, or he came up with five different kinds of human species uh, depending on you know the way they look and their characteristics and depending on like the culture and place right um, so to go real quickly uh, the, the these five for the first one uh, just in no particular order uh, was the Americanus uh, which was you know and described as red choleric righteous <laughs> uh, or having black straight hair uh, black straight thick hair uh, being stubborn zealous free painting himself red lines regulated by customs and uh, you had the, the U Europeanus uh, I, I don't speak Latin so I can kind of I'm not sure how you pronounce these things uh, but a white sanguine brownie so these are all you know I don't claim to know what he means by all of these words with abundant long hair, uh, blue eyes, a gentle, acute, inventive, uh, covered close specimens, governed by laws. Um, and this year, the Asiaticus, yellow, melancholic, stiff, black hair, etc., uh, ruled by opinions, uh, which is also yeah, severe, haughty, greedy, loose clothing. Um, Africanus, black, phlegmatic, relaxed, uh, frizz on hair, so it's thin. Uh, you know, females without shame, uh, crafty, sly, lazy, cunning, lustful, careless. And you can kind of, you kind of see where, it's, where this is going, governed by caprice, which just means that they, uh, they're lawless, basically. Um, and the last one is what he called, what he called monstrosas, which is sort of just, you know, mythological beings and, or feral humans, which is, you know, kind of like uh, the jungle book type of humans, uh, people who are, uh, I guess, feral, so to speak. Um, and uh, you can kind of see that, uh, what these different peoples are being regulated by were also within his classification of species, right? Or customs, laws, opinions, and cap you know, caprice, right? Um, so that was in 1757. And then in 1851, um, uh, as an other example, uh, there was this person, uh, Samuel Cartwright, who was, uh, I guess he was a, uh, I think he was a psychologist in the US. Um, and he wrote a book about the diseases and peculiarities of the Negro race. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there's kind of a long history of, uh, of, of the, the, the connections between psychology, like psychiatry and like racism. And this is one of the, the sort of main examples uh, that, that people point to. And uh, so, so he diagnosed, uh, allegedly, so, so to speak, he, in, in, within this book, he diagnosed uh, different sort of diseases. And one of them uh, was sort of this, this, this anesthesia uh, ethiopica, which was a mental illness that caused laziness among slaves, right? And so, and so he identified these things as by, you know, having these traits of like skin sensitivity, being mentally slow, having lesions in the body, and they're more prevalent among uh, free blacks, right? So, uh, and actually, <laughs> uh, one of the cures that he was uh, uh, he was uh, suggesting for you know for for these is you know for skin insensitivity was, you know, by whipping, right? And also with this other one too, with uh, drapetomania, which was a mental illness that causes slaves to run away, right? Which, so, uh, and it was kind of linked to this idea of like, uh, kind of like wanderlust. Um, so this uncontrollable insane impulsion to wander, right? To just basically run away. And it's a consequence of monsters who made themselves to familiar with slaves and treating them as equals. And again, one of the, the, the remedies was, you know, by, you know, uh, physically abusing them uh, again. So, uh, and maybe closer, coming a little bit closer to the present, uh, we think about IQ testing and SAT. Uh, so in, 19, in 1905, there was this uh, two French people, uh, I think they're mostly psychiatrists again, uh, psychologists, they, uh, Binet and Simon, they came up with a test to identify um, sort of mental development in, in French school children. And, um, and this, this test was used later, uh, well, was sort of readapted in World War I uh, in the US, right? By, you know, by, again, a couple of psychologists, uh, Yerick Sturm and Henry Goddard. And they adapted this Binet Simon test uh, to test for officer training. So the idea was they were gonna, you know, kind of come up with some kind of uh, metric, right? Right, to sort of, uh, you know, sort of filter out certain people, you know, to, to see if they were fit for, uh, you know, I guess to serve in the war, right? And what was interesting is that in some of these questions, there were questions about, uh, you know, just American culture. So you had to sort of know some things that was just not just about, you know, uh, certain like mental tasks, but it was also sort of, uh, it, it, it was selecting for a certain kind of person, right? So, um, 
And in fact, this was uh, this test was so uh, widely publicized after that after the war that you know people were uh, uh, you know were talking about how this was you know sort of a great tool for picking out you know soldiers I guess uh, that um, later that this this test was used uh, you know just to filter out people or to measure you know people in public schools and you know immigrants and um, and so on. Right. So, so, so this this idea of and and this sort of this idea sort of developed the, the whole idea of the IQ, this intelligence quotient that you could that you can measure uh, you can measure intelligence on a certain scale. Right. So, and you know, on the flip side of that, of course, you know, if you found people that had a certain IQ, then you would also you know sort of look at you know within a certain. Uh, range on the top, you would also have people on the who are on the bottom, right? So you would have people on the bottom. And the question is, what do you do with those people on the bottom? And this sort of kind of led to a, you know, what, what we call today is eugenics, right? Uh, where we, we want to sort of, I guess, get rid somehow of the people who didn't have uh, as much IQ or, you know, who didn't test so well on these kinds of tests, right? So for example, in 1927, there was a Supreme Court case, uh, which uh, which is Buck v. Bell, uh, where they upheld actually, uh, you know, a case for forced sterilization. So, the and this was sort of what was going on around that time, where you know, uh, people who didn't score so well on these tests were sort of, uh, well, sterilized, right? And and including people who are disabled, you know, physically or mentally, uh, and eventually also poor people. And um, also around this time was actually in 1926 uh, was the first SAT tests were held uh, and. And all, again, it was developed as you know, sort of within this this uh, this circle of ideas, right? That, that you would sort of test people um, for you know for certain 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 character traits or certain like you know uh, intelligence traits, and based on those, you would sort of filter them into certain different groups, right? And of course, you know, we still use the SAT test today, and you know, almost. Uh, the, you know, the, for the majority of college, you know, college entrance uh, exams, right, and in the U.S. and uh, and multiple, even though despite the fact that like multiple studies, you know, that have been done, you know, sort of correlate a high SAT scores with, um, you know, just you know your family income, your gender, your race, ethnicity. Uh, there's a typo here, ethnicity, uh, and you know, and and other intelligence test scores. So if you score high on SAT, you would probably score high on other IQ tests, for example, right? And, you know, and, you know, you would probably, you know, you would also correlate with certain races, genders, and, you know, sort of higher family income and so on, right? So, you know, so so this this all ties back to certain, uh, this, this idea of, you know, testing for a certain, you know, uh, for a certain, score right and this this number somehow determines you know where you are on a certain scale and where you are on that scale has huge consequences right so it sort of determines for example if what schools you went into or whether or not you got to immigrate to the us for example back in, 19, you know, in the early 1900s and nowadays it still different determines like which schools you get into and um uh and as you see uh bef at least in the early, even in the in early 1900s, it decided if you were going to be sterilized. Uh, uh, so, and I don't want to say too much about this, but you know, you know, the, the whole idea of eugenics sort of goes uh, into the whole idea of like Nazism, and I don't want to, uh, um, yeah, go too deep into this because yeah, obviously there's like way too much there to talk about. Um, so I just you know, so I just have here a. a a diagram where where it sort of explains uh, sort of the genealogies of uh, so just this, maybe just to, to speak about this real quick you know with the uh, with the, the one of the core ideas of uh, of Nazism was was this this idea of the Aryan master race right so 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 not just if you think about the Linnaeus says uh, five species even among the Europeans there were certain Europeans that were favored among other Europeans right and those were sort of the Nordic the Germanic um, you know those people from of, of like Nordic descent right or the Aryan or the Aryan race right and so uh, so depending on how much you've mixed with you know people from other races uh, you uh, well uh, you might be you might just be within you know less pure or, or, or more pure, right? And here specifically, you can see uh, uh, 
on the on the right column, you you have the Judas, you have the Jews, and in the middle you have the the Michelin, so the people who are like kind of mixed, and the and on the far left you have sort of the pure. Uh, I can't read. This is the Deutsch Blut. So I guess it means, it means you have Dutch blood. I mean, you have German blood, right? So, so it's, uh, and this, this idea of, you know, uh, racial mixing and sort of by, by, by looking at your genealogy, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same story that that's in the US, right? Uh, where, where if it's either, um, you know, if you have a drop of like black blood, or if you have, um, if you're thinking about blood quantum with like indigenous Amer Americans, right? So, these these are ideas that are not very far from the present, um, but okay. So uh, I think that's that's just science. Uh, so what about math, right? Um, oh, and oh yeah, and the last thing uh, I wanted to say about scientific racism was, you know, uh, it still goes on today, especially even like this year, right? Where there are different conceptions of, you know, whether or not uh, there have been a lot of questions about, like, oh, like maybe black people are less resistant or more resistant to the coronavirus, uh, especially in the beginning when uh, when, it, when the pandemic hit the US. Uh, it, in, at least in the beginning, the, you know, uh, sort of black communities were not as affected, right? You know, it's hit as hard, but uh, by the coronavirus, but, you know, that was in February and March, and this was in, yeah, this was in February, right? And, right, and now in, uh, as, as we're speaking in November, uh, the, you know, we we know uh, that uh, communities of color are more affected by um, by, by the coronavirus, right? Um, so and also, uh, and this was uh, in August. I mean, in September, like you know, scientists are also still uh, puzzled about why uh, Africa's fatality rates are low, right? I mean, in in. in <laughs> In certain ways, you can phrase this as a scientific question, but there's also always a certain uh, assumptions that are sort of lurking in the background as to why we're asking these kind of questions and where these questions are coming from and what sort of, um, what assumptions underlie sort of these questions, right? Uh, so, uh, okay, but on to math, right? So what about math itself? Um, so I wanna think about, uh, so my, my title here is mathematical racism, and it's sort of it's kind of a red herring because I've I've learned that the the, the more you contract the words that you're trying to say, especially with these words, um, uh, the less it, it the more it obscures. So when when I, when I talk about this, it's it's really in the context of um, how you know what kind of a role does it play? You know how how is it used? Uh, you know for you know towards races or less racist ends, right? Um, so. Uh, one of the, the big things that have been has been sort of in the news, at least it, within like sort of mathematician circles, is the idea of predictive policing. Uh, and you know, this actually goes back to I believe about ten or twelve years ago, uh, with where you know. Uh, so it's so the idea of predictive policing is is you look at crime data, right? And based on the the, the recent crime data, uh, if you would send uh, police to to, to places where uh, there have been more like reports of crime or where more crime has been discovered, right? Uh, in, in those, you know, so so uh, this has this was initially developed in uh, in Los Angeles, and this was it was a collaboration between the FBI and I believe the CIA and uh, L wait no 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 sorry it was a collaboration with the FBI, LAPD, and UCLA, right? Uh, so. So, so they developed this technology called uh, PredPol. So it's an algorithm, and it's actually, you know, uh, uh, it actually sits on a lot of mathematics, right? I mean, it's not uh, extremely complicated mathematics, but it's still it's still mathematics nonetheless. Uh, I mean, if you go on the website PredPol, they they show you uh, that here is one of our patented, uh, well, this formula that our patented algorithm uses, right? I mean, and if you look at the pattern, the pattern doesn't actually tell you uh, how the formulas work. So you actually have to do a lot of digging and it doesn't tell you what the algorithm is. So um, there's been some criticisms about the fact that this uh, algorithm is a black box and we can't really audit it. Um, and, but that's sort of uh, more of a question for sort of algorithmic justice uh, type questions. Uh, but what's interesting sort of from, from a mathematical perspective is that the, the, the equations that they use to sort of model, uh, you know, sort of to, to model you know, uh, 
well, this sort of predictive policing is based on what they call an epidemic type aftershock model, right? And so it's actually something that just, you know, it's a model in seismology. So basically you have an earthquake, which is they call a parent earthquake, right? So, um, and then that earthquake will generate aftershocks, right? So, so what, what these people are saying is that, you know, and this was a paper in 2008, and what these people are saying is that, you know, you, if you have an event, right, uh, like, uh, you know, whether it was, well, I guess, you know, it would be a, a crime, like a crime, right? If someone commits a crime somewhere, um, you would, you would say that, okay, let's, we, we would predict that, you know, that there will be another crime that happened in that area soon afterwards, right? That's the aftershock, right? And there's, there's some, you know, there's obviously, you know, some, some, some criticisms of this, of this, of these assumptions, those are broken windows policing, um, that, you know, basically the crime begets more crime. Um, and, and in fact, uh, uh, you know, several years later, it was shown, you know, using statistical and mathematical methods uh, that suggest that uh, Petpol generates what we call negative feedback loops, right? So uh, I say suggest, be again, because the algorithms are not publicly available for auditing. So the, uh, for example, the, in the first paper to predict, it, to predict and serve, uh, uh, it was a collaboration between a statistician and a political scientist. And what they did was uh, they kind of looked at, you know, the, you know, sort of, uh, some of these models um, and sort of try to sort of guess what the algorithm was, right? Uh, and, you know, and based on certain, and they made certain smart intelligent guesses and they uh, were able to use this to model, um, you know, uh, sort of a realistic scenario in Oakland County, right, in California, right? Um, and, right, and, and so, so using, you know, so using their, their statistical model, they kind of showed that uh, it generates this feedback loop, this negative feedback loop, which means that, uh, you know, if it does a crime that happened in a certain area and they sent more police to that place, then that's what sort of, so, sort of just uh, generating this feedback loop between uh, crime and like policing, right? Um, and uh, more recently in 2018, uh, there, was, there was a paper about uh, run runaway feedback loops uh, in predictive policing and there, uh, and here they use kind of like a, a, a sort of a math, a math model. So they don't use any data, but uh, they kind of use, uh, set up like kind of like a, like a very simple, what, what, we, what in math we call a toy model. Uh, so you, so you make, you make some, uh, some simplifying assumptions and you, um, you kind of just see what happens and, and see what it tells you about the more general thing and hope that it tells you something about the more general thing, because in general, you know, this, the picture that you're trying to study is very complicated. So you come up with a model for it and you try to study that model and hope that it tells you something uh, about the thing that you're trying to study, right? So that's what they do in this paper in 2018. They come up with a very simple mathematical model. And at least in their model, uh, they, they show that if, yeah, they, 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 they prove mathematically that in their model, it, you know, again, this, uh, this idea of predictive policing generates what we call run, this runaway feedback loop, right? So, um, so once, once you have a, a certain amount of bias, then it just, it just sort of tips towards that bias. Um, so, yeah, so that was predictive policing, you know, uh, basically in the last 10 years. And, uh, it, and this is not uh, something that was just limited to LA. Uh, it was in this, this, and, this product, so to speak, uh, has been marketed to, to lots, lots and lots of uh, different counties in the U.S. Right, so it's something that's actively being used, and um, and this year, uh, mm, yeah, I, I think it was started maybe earlier this year, and I think I don't remember the dates. I think it was like maybe April, uh, but. Yeah. So, um, and but the reporting was this this, rep this new reporting in Nature was only in June. That yeah. So a bunch of mathematicians came together. They wrote uh, they wrote an op ed, a uh, really short op ed, and um, and about you know fourteen. Well, I think at least fifteen hundred, maybe two thousand. I don't I don't know the number right now. But yeah, about between like one and two thousand like mathematicians researchers uh, signed on to the letter uh, calling for uh, police to stop uh, collaborations with. I mean. <laughs> Uh, for mathematicians to stop collaborations with the police, right? Um, and and here's an excerpt uh, from from the letter uh, where it says, in light of the extrajudicial murders uh, by police uh, of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and um, numerous others before them, and the subsequent brutality of police response to protests, we call on the mathematics community to boycott working with police departments, right? Um, and 
and they make it clear that this is not an abstract call. Uh, many of our colleagues can and do work with police departments and do uh, to provide modeling and data work. Um, so it is not just something that just happened, you know, just it, was, it wasn't just a one time thing at U UCLA. Uh, so, for example, one of the examples that they point out is um, is uh, there's a there's a center for computing and experimental mathematics in in, in Brown, uh, and I believe a couple of years ago, I think maybe around 2016, uh, they they had a they had a big workshop, uh, you know, uh, about you know sort of predictive policing. Uh, so yeah, so this is something that's sort of embedded within the mathematical community, uh, and so yeah, and there was this. Uh, yeah, so there's been this this pushback uh, this year, and uh, and as a result of this letter, uh, so this letter was published in uh, the, the notices of the AMS, which is the American Mathematical Society, and uh, you know that it generated, you know, it's been generating lots of back and forth. Like even you know, um, even up to I believe a couple of weeks ago, people have been uh, writing public letters and like statements uh, back and forth. Yeah, so so it's something that's that's kind of in the air right now, and that we're thinking about like. Um, uh, where where the role of of the mathematical community is within like you know thinking about uh, not not just police work but also just you know our place in society uh, because um, uh, maybe just to, to give a quick example um, my field personally is in number theory right uh, so far so far to us uh, modeling you know police uh, policing or like crime data like it's not uh, it's not something that like it, it's it's something that's pretty far from our field but um, but as it turns out within within the field of number theory uh, uh, there's a lot of applications or we we think there there's sometimes applications to cryptography right and so as it turns out uh, you know there's it's uh, it's it's half half a joke and half serious that you know if you can't get a job in academia as a number theorist then you should just go work for the NSA right uh, and I think different people have different feelings about that. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's still a conversation that I think um, uh, the number theory community hasn't quite had yet. Um, I think the, the computing community has, they, they kind of think they've been thinking and like uh, have had conversations about surveillance and, and the, the consequences of their work. But um, the number theory community, we, we haven't <laughs> uh, quite gotten there yet. So um, yeah, so there's, yeah. Uh, and one thing I want to point out uh, uh, that I won't talk about, which I uh, uh, thought I might uh, have time to think, talk about is, you know, just uh, sort of uh, the role of like statistics and data science um, within, you know, within within the role, within the, the realm of, you know, sort of racism or like social justice work, right? And uh, Partly because you know there's a lot to there's a lot to say. First of all, um, and second of all, um, I'm not a statistician. Statistician also, and and there's a lot of interesting work and in, and very f uh, detailed work that happens in statistics because uh, it's really there where people are trying to prove uh, when something is biased or not, right? And uh, people get into very deep debates, and it's uh, it, and it can get very technical very quickly. Um, but they but they are but they are all important. Uh, so, for example, uh, just to give one quick example in in New York City. Uh, there was you know for, for for quite a long time there was uh, there was a policy within within the NYPD to stop and frisk, right? And there was and the ACLU uh, sued uh, the NYPD to you know on on the grounds that uh, right on the grounds that stop and frisk was racially biased, right? And uh, and the question was, how do you actually prove that uh, stop and frisk was racially biased? Uh, and uh, and just just looking at the, at the percent at, at raw percentages doesn't always tell you the whole story. So there's there is yeah there is there's some amount of thinking that needs to be done there. Um, and yeah, so I don't yeah so that that's one example of where statistics plays a role. And data science, in a way, you can think of it as actually being applied statistics in a sense. And yeah, there's there's a whole lot of, that goes on there. Uh, I don't want to talk about that because um, I don't feel qualified to. And one other thing I do want to point out um, is there's an exciting field uh, right now that's kind of sort of growing, uh, which is sort of mathematical approaches to gerrymandering. Um, and sort of this is extremely relevant right now because uh, we've had the you know the 2020 census. Uh, you know this year, and you know based on the census, we're going to redraw the district maps, and based on those district maps, you know. 
uh, elections turn out differently. <laughs> um, uh, I won't talk about this, even though there's a lot of really cool stuff that's happening. Um, happy to talk to you about it afterwards. Uh, but it's uh, this gerrymandering right now is mainly about political gerrymandering and not racial gerrymandering because, and the reason for that is uh, because racial gerrymandering is now outlawed, <laughs> uh, technically, uh, but political gerrymandering is still fair game. And uh, so the the work that most people, the, the mathematicians have been doing uh, in the last, let, I would say the last five years or so uh, has been uh, really thinking about political gerrymandering from, with, uh, from a mathematical perspective. And so they've been you know, developing very cool tools and they've been giving um, you know, amicus briefs and like, you know, going to, going to court and, you know, there's been some great interactions there, uh, in that area, but, um, because it's more about po politics and less about, uh, uh, race per se, you know, obviously they're related. Um, I'm just going to leave that aside. Um, but yeah, just as, just, you know, if anyone's interested, um, there's this, yeah, it's, it's a big thing. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So, yeah, so so let's recap. Uh, so we we've we've thought about uh, uh, scientific racism. You know, we've looked at a few examples, and um, uh, you know, and and we've seen also ways in which uh, mathematics has been used. Uh, you know, it's 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 a couple of steps removed. You know, because you you still have to you know pass through some <laughs> patented algorithm, and uh, you know, but 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 we're still thinking. You know. We're still thinking about how mathematics plays a role in sort of, you know, policing, for example, or other other forms of. Um, uh, I don't want to say racism because racism is it, it's a big word. And but what what we what we want to think about is sort of what what what, what do we mean by these words, right? Um, so, right. So again, the question that that I'm trying to think about uh, here is: Can mathematics be used in an anti-racist way, right? And um, so, to to take a step back, uh, I want to think. I want to talk about uh, some things that other people have, have uh, talked or thought about in terms of sexism. Um, so, in twenty thirteen, uh, you know, so yeah, as and the reason for for doing this, I guess I should say, is to sort of think about how people have thought about this in sort of uh, kind of next door, right? And so, there are some ideas here that we can think of uh, as maybe sort of inspiring us to. Uh, sort of the you know think about these things you know in using these ideas right so in 2013 so Karen Petrie was a I think she's British um, a computer scientist um, and she came up with a, a, a what we call a thought experiment right which which basically goes like this right so if you had the you know uh, you know a percentage of men and women in the same room and uh, who make questionable remarks or like sexist remarks uh, to the other sex you know and so uh, suppose basically everyone is equally sexist, right? And they're making sexist remarks to each other at an equal rate, right? But, as, but if it turns out that there are fewer women in the room than men, uh, then the average woman will experience far more sexist comments than the average man, right? So this was uh, posed by Petrie as a thought experiment and um, a colleague of Petrie decided to, you know, just just run a model and like see what happens, and uh, you know, and you can kind of actually just see what, you know, how this plays out and if 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 it actually is true, right? Um, you know, and um, and so this gave rise to what we call the, the Petrie multiplier. Uh, so which kind of says that you know if you have a gender ratio of one to R, uh, where you know of oh, I guess of um, uh, women to men, right? Uh, so if R times many more men than women, then, and everyone is equally, you know, making sexist remarks to each other, uh, that women will receive R squared many times as many sexist remarks as men, right? Uh, and this was actually proved, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a physics paper uh, uh, a couple of years later, because, uh, well, in, in certain contexts, so you're assuming certain, uh, you know, certain properties about, you know, what, what is happening in this model, right? Again, this is a model, right? So you're, you know, you're assuming that, you know, you only have men and you only have women and uh, everyone's equally sexy. So that you're always, you always want to keep track of your, your assumptions. Um, but, you know, assuming that your assumptions are uh, reasonable enough um, and there are certain like 
distribution probability distributions that that one takes into account uh then yeah then then you get r squared many times as many sexes remarks as men uh so that's uh that's one example of you know uh how so people have kind of kind of tried to think about these things and um more recently in 2020 uh, there was a book by eugenia uh, cheng uh which uh which what so it's called x plus y it's a management a mathematician's manifesto for rethinking gender, uh, and it's it's more of a popular science book, so it's not it's not a technical book, so um, it's it's meant for readers who are you know just just a general audience, so it's not um, it's not specifically trying to build a theory, uh, but uh, but but she has some some interesting ideas here that I want to kind of point out. Um, so so one of one of the main core ideas in Cheng's book is is the following, right? So suppose you have numbers that divide, you look at the numbers that divide 30, right? So that's 15, 10, 6, 5, 3, 2, 1, right? So 15 divides 30, but you can also look at the numbers that divide 15, right? So 5 divides 15, 3 divides 15, 6 doesn't divide 15, right? Um, and you can also ask the same thing about 10, right? So 6 doesn't divide 10, uh, 5 and 2 divide 10, right? And so you can actually come up with, you know, uh, you know, uh, a diagram that describes this relationship, right? So, uh, so you start with thirty on the top, right? And then uh, I think there's an arrow that's missing between thirty and fifteen. So, but if thirty and fifteen, so if fifteen divides thirty, then you draw an arrow, right, uh, between thirty and fifteen. If thirty divides, if ten divides thirty, so you 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 put an arrow between thirty and ten, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so you have this relationship, right, that's sort of mediated between like three and so since. 30 divides uh, is divisible by six and six is divisible by three, then you can get from 30 to three, right? So 30 is also divisible by three, right? Um, so now Cheng says, okay, so let's let's think about this um, categorically because Cheng is uh, what we call a category theorist. And so there's a, there's a field of mathematics called category theory, right? And the idea there is you wanna think about um, objects, but also the relations between them, right? So, uh, so in Cheng's book, you have this diagram. Uh, I should, uh, oh, yeah, this, this, this diagram is in Cheng's book. So I was, I was thinking I should, I should footnote this somewhere, but yeah, <laughs> I should cite this, but yeah. So this is in Cheng's book. Um, and you have this diagram and, uh, you know, and here you have like rich white male, rich white non-male, and, and you have this relationship, right? And, if, and, and, and you can see this is kind of like a hierarchy of privilege, which, um, you know, you can you can you can decide whether or not you like this, uh, but but this this is the way the way Cheng describes it, right? So uh, you have the rich white male who's sort of maybe better off than a poor white male, which is maybe better off than a poor non-white male, and which is better off than a poor non-white non-male, right? So to speak, right? And so the arrow is kind of like an arrow of like privilege, right? Um, and so, uh, but again, you still get this kind of a diagram, right? And so Cheng is saying, okay, well, let's, you know. Uh, let's uh, let, let's think of this as you know as being able to sort of uh, this sort of graphically describe this these relationships that we're kind of talking about, right? Um, and whether it's useful or not, it's well, is it useful or not? And so there was a, there was a review in the New York Times by Kathy O'Neill, and O'Neill was uh, also a number theorist who uh, became uh, I don't know what Kathy is doing right. I mean, uh, Kathy O'Neill uh, I think became worked for a hedge fund and then uh, after that um, joined the Occupy, Occupy movement and then now like works to um, works to audit algorithms. And so, yeah, so O'Neill wrote a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, uh, which I do recommend if, you, if you're interested in this kind, these kind of things. Uh, right, so in O'Neill's review of uh, Cheng's book, so which, you know, was, was a pretty fair review, you know, uh, and 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 O'Neill wrote notes that notes that you know even if there are weaknesses in this paradigm, um, and you know Cheng already admits and identifies some of these weaknesses, um, she she suggests a generous reading of her manifesto again by analogy, uh, and and this is true that in math a theory is judged by the breadth of examples it unifies. So so you know I have this box, but this box kind of describes relationships uh, of different things, not just of numbers, but also you know of people in some in some way, right. Uh, and and the amount of light it sheds on those examples. So what does it tell us about these things, right? Uh, 
And a theory doesn't have to be perfect to be useful. And I say the same for Chang's manifesto on gender. So that, that's, you know, it, it feels like a bit of a lukewarm remark, right? Uh, it could be useful. I don't know. Uh, and it could be perfect, but it doesn't have to be perfect to be useful. So, so, we're, so we're saying that this isn't a perfect model, but, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect to be useful. And um, we'll, we'll see what happens, right, is kind of what O'Neill is saying, right? Um, so, right? okay. Uh, so I'll pause there. Uh, and so we'll think about what we've had so far. So we've had uh, sort of this Cheng's idea of, um, of kind of thinking sort of, sort of categorically in terms of drawing these map or these uh, arrows between uh, relationships between different things and different people. And uh, this idea of Petri about this Petri multiplier. So, so these people have kind of been uh, raising some kind of mathematical ways of thinking about um, you know, sexism or gender oppression. Uh, and, and, you know, again, they're not perfect, but they sort of open up uh, possibilities, right? right? So for people to start thinking more along those lines, right? And you, so the, the way I like to think about these things is, okay, well, if you didn't like it, what did you like about it? And what could you do better, right? Uh, so, so, and as, as O'Neill says, it doesn't have to be perfect to be useful, right? Um, and that, and, and that, that's how models work, right? Um, even in, you know, in physics, if you had like Newtonian mechanics, you know, um, like Newton's model wasn't great. So Einstein had to come up with a better model. And so, and, and now physicists are trying to come up with a better model for Einstein's work, right? Um, so here are some ideas that, you know, uh, that I wanted to sort of raise, you know, so uh, first of all, can the pet pull algorithm be used to model police brutality instead, right? That's, that's, a, that's an interesting question to me, right? Because if you think about the predictive policing algorithm, um, it, that, it's it's based on uh, earthquakes, right? That has nothing to do with uh, uh, you know how humans behave, how uh, how the data is collected, how um, yeah how crime works, right? It's 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 literally a, a superimposition or or an imposition of uh, some some model that that you know that seemed to work in geology and someone. Uh, imposed it on you know crime data and said it kind of works. Um, so you know if yeah so so uh, so one question I you know I, one could ask is can this algorithm also be used to model police brutality instead, right? And practically speaking, you know since we don't have access to the algorithm, but we have access to the you know the equations that model it, so you can actually kind of uh, run something that looks like that um, and see if it works. Um, Another question could be, uh, can the Petri multiplier be applied to racism instead of sexism, right? Uh, and if you think of the Petri multiplier, uh, sort of the thought experiment, it was about having two groups of people where they were equally discriminatory, <laughs> uh, making equally discriminatory remarks and an equally uh, discriminatory rate, right? And as long as there was one group that was, that was uh, uh, more numerous right, than the other group, then this, the, the, the minority group would receive, uh, I guess, discriminatory remarks at uh, at a squared rate, right? at a much higher rate than the other people, right? Again, these are these are just models, right? But but you can see how this 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 sort of mathematical thinking uh, is uh, is about abstraction, right? It's it's about abstraction, but not not to the level of being being dis being disconnected from reality, but it's 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 asking, you know. What, what about this is the same ab about something else, right? That you can apply it uh, in this other situation, right? Um, and and um, and in, at least in these two cases, it seems it seems to make sense that uh, at least at least just from the fact that they're not specific about the things that they're trying to study, right? Um, and uh, the third one uh, is you know can we push Chang's theory a little further, right? And this is a qualitative question, right? Because um, Especially, you know, between the first and the third. The first is, you know, you you really want to look at data, and you and you and you're sort of sending police to a certain place, and you know, in uh, and you're trying to model a certain, a certain situation. Uh, but if you think about Chang's theory, it's it's very qualitative, right? And that's the kind of thing that I'm uh, I would like to think about because um, you know, there's a certain obsession with math, math as a quantitative science. Right, uh, you know, we're we're all about numbers, about like measuring things, and which to an extent that is absolutely true. Um, you know, we, you know, math does form the foundation of data science and statistics and everything else. Um, but it's also, you know, 
a whole lot of mathematics that's more qualitative than quantitative. Like we don't we don't count things. We um, well we we build theories, right? And that's the same thing with with you know the social sciences of the humanities, right? Um, if you're in you know sociology or anthropology or something, um, there are people who do quantitative stuff, but there's also a lot of people who do qualitative stuff, right? So there's a lot of qualitative thinking about these sort of things, and especially when you come to things like racism or race, it's just just race or gender, right? things like those. Um, you really you know, there's a lot of you know, qualitative thinking about these things, right? Or I would argue that most of the thinking about these things is qualitative. Um, so, yeah, so I'll, I'll focus on the third question here and um, I'm running out of time a little bit. So, uh, but uh, I have to warn everyone that uh, the the next about four slides or so is they're math heavy and um, <laughs> this is a math colloquium. So I decided to let myself do it. <laughs> Uh, but um, yeah, and uh, but before we jump to this, I need to uh, uh, add a disclaimer that none of this will solve racism. Uh, so, so, uh, and in the words of Saidia Hartman, which is you know she's a, a professor at Columbia and she's a MacArthur genius who sort of uh, people think of her as an Afro pessimist, um, and and so in 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 Hartman's words, uh, yeah, so. Uh, the possessive investment in whiteness can't be rectified by learning how to be more anti-racist. So it just doesn't, it won't solve the problem, right? So it requires a radical divestment in the project of whiteness and a redistribution of wealth and resources. It requires abolition, and abolition of the carceral world, the abolition of capitalism. What is required is a remaking of the social order and nothing short of that is going to make a difference, right? That's, I mean, it, it's a it's a kind of a radical statement, but um, yeah, there's, so this, this this year is just to sort of uh, uh, be here as a disclaimer that you know this you know whatever we talk about today is not gonna <laughs> it's not gonna save the world, uh, but um, but but it's it's still worth thinking nonetheless I believe. Uh, so um, so uh, I want to sort of in the next four slides I'll just kind of kind of draw you know. Uh, sketch kind of a framework for sort of thinking about a, a little more categorically about uh, what Cheng has already started talking about. Um, so uh, so what's a category, right? <laughs> so I'm going to try to uh, introduce you to a category theory, um, but I don't know, I don't, I'll, I'll mainly point you to what's important, right? So uh, this is this is a topic that only gets taught in grad school, but you can actually teach it to a middle school, middle school student or like, you know, high school student. Uh, so a category consists of a collection of objects, A, B, and C, and so on, right? Whatever they are. Um, and there are certain arrows between these objects, between A and B, B and C, and um, there's a there's a composition law that we that we require, right? So if A and B have an arrow and B and C have an arrow, then you should have an arrow between A and C, right? Um, and what's important about this uh, is that C, this category C, keeps track not only of objects but also the relation between objects, right? Um, and an easy example is. Um, you look at positive integers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, right? And let's say we'll draw an arrow between A and B if A divides B evenly. So two divides six, so we, we draw an arrow between two and six, right? Um, and if uh, two divides six and six divides 12, well, uh, two divides, wait, <laughs> uh, two should divide 12, right? This should be a 12, um, sorry about that, uh, right? So, you, you, so the, the composition works, right? Um, and this actually gives you uh, Cheng's example, um, right? So it gives you that box, right? This uh, uh, of this, this relationship between the numbers that were dividing 30, right? Um, so that's the easy one, right? Because those are just numbers. And what about Cheng's second example? How do we do that, right? Um, and it's really hard, <laughs> uh, but let's try. Um, so we'll define a category uh, to be, well, so we need the objects. So pre previously the objects were just numbers. Um, so our objects would be a collection of people. So it's just P1 and P2. Uh, uh, some people might take offense that I've labeled people as P1 and P2, uh, but this, this is how we start. Uh, and arrows defined by some relation between the people, right? So, so these are relations that we, um, that, that we can determine, that we can determine, right? So, uh, for ourselves. So if, you know, in Cheng's example, it was a privilege, right? This, this relation was privilege. So if P1 has more privilege than P2, we draw an arrow. P1 uh, uh, is, you know, more privileged than P2, right? Um, 
and you know you could define other relations like social relations or biological relations like you know you know by you know ancestry for example and material power relations right so these are these are things that people really study in like the social sciences but you know we could try to model that maybe um and if p1 is related to p2 and p2 is related to p3 then p1 is related to p3 uh so you do get this composition still like you know in some sense you know we will we'll want to try to make these things make sense so so you know p1 will be say if it was privileged then p1 would, would be more privileged than p3 right because of this composition law so at least so far, it does make sense, right? Um, and this extract, but what the cool thing is that this extract uh, definition is flexible, right? So you can consider, uh, instead of them being like individual people, you can consider them to be groups of people. Uh, maybe they could be in different countries or uh, different towns or, you know, different, yeah, they, they could be anything. Uh, and the arrows would just be the, some relation between them that you would want to study, right? Um, so, uh, so this is necessarily flexible, but, but what's interesting is that this is kind of built into category theory, right? So um, again, the, the, the important thing is that category theory um, keeps track, not just of the objects, but also the relations between things, right? Um, now, <laughs> we're trying to work with Cheng's example, but Cheng's example was about uh, rich white males, which was about race, class, and gender, and doing all those three things at the same time, it's really complicated. So. Um, uh, I'll just try to talk about race, uh, and it's already going to be super hard. Um, so, so, but, but, but this leads us down to asking, how do we do race, right? Uh, and uh, the way, you know, maybe for now, I'll talk about race is uh, to talk about this thing that we call racial formation theory, uh, which was uh, developed by sociologists who are Michael Omi and Howard Weinert in 1986, uh, which basically explains uh, they, they sort of describe uh, racial formation as a process by which social, economic, political forces determine content and, and the importance of uh, racial categories, which is kind of the long way of saying that race is socially constructed, right? It doesn't, it doesn't come from the sky, right? So it, it comes somewhere, from somewhere. And uh, we want to think about how it comes out, how, how it arises, right? So, um, and here, obviously, we're drawing from social scientists because you know they've really done, done done the work in thinking about these things. And the question is, how do we translate that, right? Um, so the first thing is that we want to consider C was, which was the the category of like the people that we're considering is part of larger social structure, right? Because because we don't live in a vacuum, we interact with other things, right? Uh, but we haven't defined it yet, uh, and um, yeah, and it's going to be a very vague definition. So I'll just uh, define it to be a collection of people. Uh, not just people, but also objects or institutions, different things that sort of make up your social structure that you're trying to uh, sort of think about, right? And the relations will still be relations between these things. So you, you could have relations between people uh, or people and objects or objects and objects or people and institutions. And uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit vague and I admit that, but uh, what's, what's, what's useful is that it, it, again, within the definition, it's flexible enough for you to sort of um, see where it goes. Um, right. Uh, so then, okay, out of this social structure, uh, you, this so, so the idea is that the social structure produces what we call a racial formation. So it determines uh, race somehow, right? So, so the, the forces of like, you know, you know social, political, economic forces, uh, these things determine race in some sense, right? So we'll, we'll think of the racial formation as a function of the social structure, right? Um, and so just to uh, take an example, we'll just suppose that our, you know, racial formation would just be the U.S. census category. Right? So black, Latin, well, actually, Latinx is not a <laughs> census category. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, Native American, Asian, and so on. Um, but what's important, what's interesting is ours is a category, so you actually do want to keep track of relations between each of these racial formations, right? Um, so how do these, you know, how do these, you know, racial formations uh, interact with each other? you know, that the theory already is asking you to consider these things, right? So they're complicated things, obviously, but the theory is asking you to fill in that gap, right? And so you have to figure it out. Um, and on the other hand, um, the racial formation determines the racialization of a people group. So somehow uh, the racial formation is still some abstract thing, but how, how, do, how do we think of people as being racialized, right? As being black, as being white, as being, you know, Asian or something else. Um, so somehow 
the, the racial formation determines, uh, uh, you know, where these people in this category fall into, right? So you could have like, uh, among among the people in that you're looking at, this category of people you're looking at, you'll have like, like what we call a subcategory, right? Uh, so you have a subcategory of like black people, Latinx people, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and so it's, um, and and also uh, this, we all, again want to think about uh, the relationships between this racial formation and that tells you about relationships between these groups, right? Um, okay, <laughs> I'll stop there. That was all the math that's uh, going on right now. Um, and that was a lot, what could this be good for? And so I'll just uh, summarize here real quick. Um, so that was a lot, it, it should be a lot and it should be complex because um, it's a hard question. Uh, and so hopefully this convinces you that there's no easy answer to the question, um, you know, and it's only a model. Uh, a theory doesn't have to be perfect to be useful. Um, it's sort of just a starting point and someone else can like try to sort of say, okay, this doesn't work because of what reason and try to fix, make it better, right? Um, but what's, what's, but we kind of see a couple of things where it's already kind of becoming useful, right? That uh, you can see that this model already denaturalizes race, right? We are thinking of it as being arising from something that's um, uh, out of like the social structure, right? And not just something that's sort of just given to you as like five different races, right? And it accounts for relations, not just relations, but also structures, right? Social structures. And um, it's actually a more general, instead of racial formation theory, it is, uh, you know, there's a, a his, Yale historian, Gary Okihiro, um, sort of describes this thing called social formation theory. And, you know, we can think about other, other forms of, you know, other formations that are not just, not just racial formations. Um, and so if you think of racial formation, an example of social formation, then you can also consider class and gender and try to think intersectionally, which, uh, as you can see, it will get a lot more harder mathematically, right? And it, again, it should be hard. Um, and uh, there's other, <laughs> You know other ways you can push this 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 thinking, and I, I won't I won't talk about it. Um, but yeah, so uh, this might not be the talk that you're expecting, but uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> All right, uh, any okay? So I'll stop there, and uh, yeah, I'll take uh, questions. Anyone in the chat wants to say anything? Um, Thank you, Tianan. Um, if anyone has questions, please let me know and I can unmute you so you can ask. You don't have to chat. Yeah. Um, Tian? Yeah. I'd have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking a little bit about gerrymandering. Well, you, you touched on it, mm -hmm. um, but then you said you, you could say more. Could you say more about gerrymandering? I'm just, I'm in the, you know, the election state of mind here. Oh yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I'm just, I'm just really fascinated by that whole uh, phenomenon. And I think you said that, um, you know, political gerrymandering isn't the same as racial gerrymandering. Right. Uh, right. Which I, I get um, to the degree, though, that, you know, certain cohorts of people might vote in, you know, along one um, mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. persuasion or the others. There, there is kind of some overlap, but yeah. But could you say more about gerrymandering? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so you're right that it... Uh... Yeah, there is some you know correlation between you know how certain uh, racial groups uh, vote. But so what I think the main question, one of the main questions people are trying to ask right now in a study mathematically is uh, how do you measure gender matter? How do you quantify it, right? Um, and it's it turns out to be an extremely hard question. Um, so people have come up with different ways of measuring, uh, different uh, metrics for uh, for measuring gerrymandering, and um, and trying to sort of see if that, uh, uh, so for, so one, one, one example is um, uh, what they call like the efficiency gap, that's one of them. And basically in terms of like uh, wasted votes, right? So you, so I think that that's one of the things that we're thinking about right now, right? If like, if I just voted, so uh, let's say, you know, in, I don't know, uh, 
Massachusetts, right? Uh, in Massachusetts, it's, it's it's completely blue state. So if you voted in Massachusetts, your vote is useless, right? Well, if you voted, well, either way, no matter which way you vote, you, it's useless. Uh, you, you might feel it's useless, right? So um, so the question is, how do you get to a point where um, where your vote, where you where where you you're trying to minimize the amount of um, what we call wasted votes, where you feel like your vote actually matters, right? So right now we are looking at swing states, for example, right? And there you would feel like your vote actually makes a big difference, right? Because, you know, right now we're on like the, the edge of like, you know, a per, like percentage points, right? Uh, and so, so that's where votes aren't wasted, right? That's where your votes actually, you know, are efficient, so to speak, you know? So that, that's one way that people are trying to sort of um, managing gerrymandering uh, in terms of, um, uh, if if there is a sort of uh, a large gap, right? Then then um, people 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 are thinking that maybe that that that's an indicator that um, that there was some gerrymandering going on there. Uh, but it's not. Again, it's it's a very tricky thing. With people aren't. It's not clear. Uh, so that's one example. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, we have questions from Tom and Maggie. So first, we'll give to Tom. Tom, you can uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you, Tiana. That was a really fascinating talk, um, and I think it traced back some of the historical um, thought processes and really illustrated where they uh, to really what a horrible place those those thought processes lead. Um, so my question. Oh, oh uh, but first, I want to make a point about. Uh, Mathematics and science in service of human rights. I think the, 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 the it's even part of a more broader topic about how science and mathematics can be either misused or used in service of, of human rights as well, um, as we can see uh, in, in many ways. So I wanted to ask you about the model, the category three model that you set up later at the end. I think mm -hmm. uh, you were saying that this, the racialization is a functor so, mm -hmm. but the, the, how would the racialization functor be defined? Is that something that could be like trained uh, as, a, as a model, uh, like if through data or were you, is that something you want to just leave open um, as un, undetermined in the model? Right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting question. I guess the, maybe the short answer is that if you, um, if you could train it, how would you know you trained it well is a hard question, I think, to figure out. Um, but I think it's a worthy question. <laughs> uh, and definitely it's, yeah, I think because the thing is, as yeah, uh, I didn't say it was a functor, but yeah. So to think of that f of s as a functor, then it, because you, you want to somehow take into account the different things that sort of go into what we, like guess the production of race or whatever, uh, thing you're thinking about like gender or something, right? And like, are the economic forces, historical processes or um, yeah, you know, sort of politics or institutions like stuff like these. And uh, yeah, and I think, I, I, yeah, I, I agree that, you know there should be a way to sort of maybe try to figure it out. Um, uh, I don't know about quantifying it uh, because yeah, because if you were trying to model it on something or train it on something that means you have data that's meaningfully measurable, and I, yeah, I think I think that's 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 that that uh, that's a hard place to get to. But um, yeah, I don't I don't want to say it's not possible. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, now I see that Maggie also has a question. Um, Maggie, can you unmute your microphone? All right, did I unmute? Yes, yes. I, think I did. All right, so my question actually has to do with both of the other two questions, vaguely. <laughs> um, th so there probably should be an arrow between them, but um, just kidding. Uh, I was thinking about this, this gerrymandering idea or in general, um, well, let me back up a second. I was thinking about how I used to always joke about, you know, teaching a calculus class and I would tell my students, use this only for good and not for evil. 
And I kind of relate that to, um, uh, I kind of joking, I was, that was a joke, but it, it really could be, could apply to any, anything really, um, like any occupation that you have or, um, you know, job or career that you have to try to use it in an anti-racist way. Um, and then back to Kendi's book where he's talking about if you're not actively anti-racist, then you're racist. So there's not, there's just not nothing in between. So then I was thinking about the election and also, um, and and not gerrymandering, but how some votes count more than others, and mm. um, and how you could actively, you know, participate more by physically moving your self and registering in a different district um, where you could have more of an impact and how that would be possibly more or less um, anti-racist. Um, so I don't know, there's just so many thoughts like does grocery shopping, can grocery shopping be anti-racist or racist? You know, or everyday mundane things. Uh, I mean, you think of mathematics as being so neutral, but obviously it's, it's not if it's being used in ways that, um, I don't know, could be considered um, having an impact on one group of people negatively. That's all, I, mine was more of a comment, not a question, but that's it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. I mean, maybe one thing I'll say, the, the one thing I'll say is that um, uh, I think on the one hand, there is certain, you know, yeah, you can you can ask this question about any any field or anything. Uh, but you know, first of all, I'm a math person, so <laughs> I have to ask this of my field. Uh, and I think especially in math people, there is an extra um, assumption that math is neutral and so uh, that's worth reconsidering sometimes and, but on the other hand I think I think the opposite of neutral isn't good or bad so so I don't actually you know you know I guess cards on the table I don't completely agree with you know Kendi's like if you're not this then you're that kind of a binary thinking mm -hmm. right so I don't I don't think the opposite of neutrality is you know you know uh, binary binariness. <laughs> Right, um, right. So I, I feel like there's there's some kind of I don't want to say generosity, but kind of like complexity to add to you know the, the the picture, right? So for example, like right now we're all about partisan politics, but um, that's the way the system is set up, right? And you know what if that was like a what, what if it was a three party system? What would politics look like? Like we, <laughs> you know, or you know, five party system, you know, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. or something, you know. Um, so, yeah, I guess just just you know, try trying to think more beyond just you know, if not if you know, A and B is. Uh, I think that that can be helpful. Yeah. I don't know how to mute myself again though. Now. <laughs> yeah, I, think I muted you, Maggie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, does anyone uh, have other questions or comments? Mahesh, if you're still there, do you want to talk about uh, that ICERM conference? Yeah. I don't know. Just a second. Oops. I'm sorry, uh, this list is moving. Can you, did you unmute? Okay. Yeah, I did, I think. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. So I was actually one of the participants at the ISM conference on predictive policing. Oh, cool. And, uh, and this was focused on the Rhode Island, uh, basically Providence and the neighboring areas. And uh, though we, I don't think anything very uh, substantial came out of the conference. Part of it was lots of people were starting data scientists for example, our focus was on uh, response time to 911 calls and other calls which were there. And we, mm -hmm. lots of our friends actually, people who were there went out uh, with the cops in their cars to see how policing actually happens. Mm -hmm. 
on the streets and uh, and from my perspective i think what what the police would be happy to see is if they if we could just in any way justify that there was lack of resources for them mm. to do a better job mm. they would they would they would agree with any algorithm that made that point uh, <laughs> enough cues were given to that effect uh, yes. to us uh, and 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 there, there were lack of resources and you just you did see that data was not very good the data was mm. the, the data quality was fairly poor and and that is true of most uh, real life data right. so uh, and i don't i don't have this um, in, one can do a good job of assisting uh, for example whether i understand the context in which policing is uh, uh, taking place right now or you have some of these instances which are absolutely uh, uh, heartbreaking uh, but i at the same time i think we can we sh- we we can help just like you said uh, but whenever any algorithm is developed one has to check how the algorithm performs over various sectionalities of data of society uh, because the algorithm may perform very very well for example when it's responding to Uh, say white male or to rich people uh, and you can get very high accuracies but it may be going terribly wrong for smaller sections of society uh, and that may go unnoticed so just checking the algorithm on various sections of society and if it does not perform equally well in all of them then no matter how accurate the algorithm is it is actually a, it's not a good one and uh, i so we, we we did not use the model that was being that the people at ucla uh, and though andre was one of the organizers of the conference mm-hmm. uh, and our focus more was looking at it from the point of view of uh, operations research mm-hmm. yeah and th- that's all yeah. I, i i don't think i had to i had anything to add as such i just mm-hmm. ma- mentioned that yeah yeah that's cool yeah that's in context yeah. yeah so um i'm going to um Now, uh, another comment from Wisam. So I should have allowed you to unmute. You can unmute. Hello. We can hear you. Hi. So just one thing I wanted to comment about, uh, especially recording um, about SATs and the Binet's Simone IQ testing. Mm-hmm. Before I even um, witnessed all this information that you gave us, which was a lot, frankly, and actually very interesting. One thing that came to mind when I was considering math is racism obviously you know what finding the area under the curve i don't think is racist right but when i think of something like the sat and how certain populations urban populations are just going to be from the beginning disadvantaged not based on their iq or whatever just based on their life experiences and what the sort of questions are asking this made me think that yes it can definitely be racist at least in that term Um, I, there was a famous quote I've heard about, um, about testing and this sort of standardized testing. It's, it was like referred to as testing a chimpanzee's, a, a testing a, um, how do you say this? An animal's ability to climb a tree. And you're giving this test to a chimpanzee, a frog, a fish, and a dolphin. All these people come from very different backgrounds. They're not all the same, not in any way. And you're not really testing per- people's IQ. You're testing... more their backgrounds really that's all i had to say yeah totally i mean i think um i think it's somewhat known that uh i believe it's sat scores that are, uh, you can fairly well you can predict you can predict them fairly well just by someone's zip code i think right. yeah i can definitely see that yeah. mm-hmm. i think the um uh, the strongest predictor is the socioeconomic status of your of your mm-hmm. parents mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Are there any other questions or comments? This was great. Yeah. Thanks. Really interesting. Really interesting. All right. Let's all, um, I guess, clap in silence. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Diana. <laughs> It was a very nice talk. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.
Bye. Bye. Merci.